uh, unfortunately I'm missing Indicate for the first time in many years. But I'm still going to do a talk from a boat. At the beginning of the computer game industry, there were no companies, just indies. The first games on computers were made before home computers even existed. Master's thesis project in 1952 by A.S. Douglas, the game OXO, is the earliest known game to display graphics on a monitor. IBM employee Arthur Samuel wrote one of the earliest checkers programs that was demonstrated on national television in the United States in 1956. This checkers game was even capable of self-improvement by analyzing its mistakes in playing opponents. William Higginbotham, a physicist, made this game in his spare time in 1958 on an oscilloscope to entertain guests at the annual Visitor's Day at Brookhaven National Laboratory. The game is called Tennis for Two. This game foreshadowed the Pong phenomenon of the 70s a full 14 years earlier. Steve Russell and his friends at MIT wanted to make a really impressive program to demonstrate the power of the PDP-1. Thus, Steve created one of the first digital computer games. Space War is the first widely available and influential computer game. DEC put Space War onto every PDP-1 it sold, thereby ensuring its distribution to university students everywhere. No one commissioned Steve to create the game, nor did he make the game for money. He made it because it was cool. Will Crowther, the inventor of the text adventure, was first a pioneer in inventing the internet when he worked on the ARPANET technology in the early 70s. Will was a caver, that means he explored caves, and he was a D&D player. In 1975, he combined the two to create the first text adventure for his kids on a PDP-10, Colossal Cave Adventure. It was a seminal computer game that influenced the first decade of game design and created a new game genre, the text adventure. Then, Steve Wozniak and Steve Jobs showed up, and they invented and marketed the first mostly assembled home computer with the Apple I. Then, finally, the first fully assembled home computer, the Apple II, just a year later in 1977. The computer game explosion was about to begin. First, Bob Bishop bought one of the first Apple I computers in 1976, and one of the first Apple II computers, serial number 13, in 1977. By the end of 1977, Bobby created the first four graphics games for the computer, Rocket Pilot, Star Wars, Saucer Invasion, and Space Maze. His Apple Vision demo that came with every Apple II inspired hundreds of game programmers. Bill Budge bought an Apple II computer in 1980 and started programming games because graphics programming was interesting. His first game was Penny Arcade, which he traded for a Centronics printer to Apple Computer. His following games were distributed by a traveling floppy disk salesman who traveled store to store. It turned out that making games was quite lucrative. Raster Blaster, in 1981, had amazing sales and was on Softalk's top 30 for months. Nasser Jabelli began programming the Apple II in 1980 and quickly created an assortment, an assortment of games, his fifth game being the huge hit of 1981, Gorgon, a Defender clone for the Apple II. Nasser was quite prolific. He made six games in one year and he never saved source code. He typed each line of 6502 assembly language directly into the computer, and each line was turned immediately into machine code. There were no comments saved. John Freeman's first computer game, Starfleet Orion, was made in 1978. It was the first space-themed war game written for a microcomputer, an 8K Commodore PET. Jim Connolly programmed the game, as John Freeman is a game designer. Silas Warner started making games in the late 70s on the Plato system. He created Conquest, Orbit War, and Air Race, as well as contributed to Empire. 
Silas's first computer game was Maze Game for the Apple II. He wrote five published games before he created the legendary Castle Wolfenstein on the Apple II in 1981. Silas got the idea to create Castle Wolfenstein after seeing the video game Berserk in a 7-Eleven store. Berserk had voice and featured randomly generated mazes. Silas had just finished making a program called The Voice that could speak words, and he also finished making a game about robots called Robot War. He didn't want to use robots again, so after watching the movie The Guns of Navarone, he decided on using Nazis for his maze game. The SS guards take the place of Berserk's evil Otto. Steve A. Baker was a prolific game programmer in the late 70s and early 80s. His first game was Fighter Pilot in 1978. He later worked on many Atari console and home computer games. After having played Oubliette on the Plato system, Robert Woodhead and Andrew Greenberg designed Wizardry, Proving Grounds of the Mad Overlord in 1979. Robert initially programmed the game in AppleSoft Basic on the Apple II, and he named it Dungeons of Despair. The game was too slow for Robert. He then reprogrammed the game in Pascal, but he had to wait for an Apple II runtime system to be released before they could even publish the game. So, Wizardry had a full year of beta testing from dozens of D&D fans with constant tweaking and polishing before its release in 1980. Richard Garriott was exposed to computers in 1975. He learned BASIC, and he created 28 D&D adventure games during his high school years. In the summer of 1979, he worked at Computerland, and he saw the Apple II computer for the first time and was inspired by its color graphics. He named his next game a Calabeth, and he sold it in the Computerland store. This was 1979. His mom drew the cover, if you can believe that. A company named California Pacific Computer saw the game, and they offered to publish it. They sold 30,000 copies, and Richard got $5 per copy. So Richard entered the University of Texas at Austin, having made $150,000 with his first published computer game. This was just the beginning of his long journey in the game industry. Bob Clarity created the Dungeon Campaign and Wilderness Campaign games in 1979. These were some of the very first graphics Dungeons & Dragons based games on home computers. Also created in 1979 by Dave Leveling, Mark Blank, Tim Anderson, and Bruce Daniels, the game Zork was directly influenced by Colossal Cave. The game Zork was a port from the 1977 mainframe of the same name. The game was so large on mainframes that to fit on a home computer it had to be split into three parts. Zork was originally written in the MDL programming language on a PDP-10. At the end of the 70s, Ken Williams brought home a teletype terminal and his wife Roberta played Colossal Cave Adventure on it. She played all the way through the game, and she was in love with adventure games. She wanted to play more, but it was hard to find any back then, so she decided that she wanted to make one, but she decided to use graphics because it would be cooler. Ken bought an Apple II and programmed Mystery House while Roberta drew 70 pictures of each location in the game. Thus, the graphic adventure was born in 1980. Scott Adams created Adventureland in 1978 and it was based on Colossal Cave Adventure on mainframes. It was not only the first text adventure to be commercially published and sold for the then new home computers, but it was the first commercially available adventure game of any kind that you could play on the computers. The machine language source code for Adventureland was also published in Byte magazine in 1980. Galactic Empire was created in 1979 by Doug Carlston on his TRS-80. He and his brother Gary started selling the game directly to computer stores. The procedurally generated worlds of Minecraft all date back to this game, Beneath Apple Manor, by Don Worth. It was the first roguelike game created two years before even Rogue was created. These pioneering indies were selling their games directly into computer stores. 
They decided to take matters into their own hands and create a business, which became an industry. Bill Budge started his own company, Budgeco, to publish his game's Raster Blaster and Pinball Construction Set. He realized he could do what the big distributors were doing, which was putting discs in Ziploc bags and selling them to computer stores. Budgeco was just Bill and his sister who did the accounting. Nasser Jabelli co-founded Siri Software in 1980 with Jerry Jewell so they could distribute their games and grow a business around it. John Freeman and Jim Connolly founded Automated Simulations in November 1978 to distribute their game, Starfleet Orion. Immediately thereafter, they created the Temple of Apshai, which was a massive success. In 1981, they decided to rename their company Epix. And a string of hits followed in the 1980s. Epix was an early game industry success story. Silas started Muse Software to publish his games and many others. Both Steve Baker and Bob Bishop wrote many of the earliest home computer games. They finally found a small publisher that could sell them, named Soft Tape. This was the very first computer game publisher in the industry in 1977. These games were all on cassette before disk drives were available. Norm Serotech saw the huge sales of Robert Woodhead's Dungeons of Despair at the Boston Apple Fest in 1980 and immediately co-founded Surtech Software with Robert to publish his game. Surtech published many indie games such as Rescue Raiders, Crypt of Medea, Deep Space, and Jagged Alliance. In fact, Wizardries 5 through 7 were all freelance indie games developed by David W. Bradley and delivered to Surtech for publishing. After publishing Ultima 1 with California Pacific Computer in 1981, Ultima 2 with online systems in 1982, Richard Garriott decided to start his own game publisher, Origin Systems, in 1983. The first game hot off the press, Exodus Ultima 3. And of course, many of the games followed suit. Caverns of Callisto, 2400 AD, Space Rogue, Times of Lore, Ogre, Mobius, Windwalker, Bioforge, Wing Commander, Privateer, Crusader, Ultima Underworld, Ultimas 4 through 9, and many others, with the company's last major achievement being Ultima Online. In 1978, Bob Clarity needed to publish his Dungeon Campaign and Wilderness Campaign games, so he created Northwest Synergistic Software, later shortened to Synergistic Software. This was one of the earliest game publishers. They even published some of Nasser Jabelli's earliest games before he started Series Software. To publish Zork, the game's authors, along with Joel Berez, created Infocom, the most successful text adventure company of its time. Many amazing text adventures followed and kept Infocom at the top for several years, all just because they wanted to publish Zork. Ken and Roberta needed to sell their first game Mystery House, so they created online systems in 1979, which was then renamed to Sierra Online in 1982, and then finally Sierra Entertainment. These indie developers turned publishers launched dozens of successful titles, eventually selling the company for $1.5 billion in 1996. Scott Adams started Adventure International in 1978 so he could sell his Adventureland game. Dozens of great games followed, not just text adventures, but arcade action games too. Doug Carlston needed to publish his Galactic Empire series of games in 1980, so he created Broderbun Software with his brother and sister. Many dozens of successful titles followed, such as Load Runner, Chop Lifter, Droll, Spare Change, Raid on Bungling Bay, Karateka, Prince of Persia, Where in the World is Carmen San Diego, and Myst. Doug sold Broderbund in 1998 for $420 million. A significant non-game, The Print Shop, started on the Apple II in 1984 and is still sold today. So the game industry started growing up. Trip Hawkins left marketing at Apple Computer in early 1982, a millionaire, and he started the EA in May of that year. EA was funded by three large Silicon Valley VC firms, so it wasn't an indie company at all. But Trip saw game programmers as digital artists that would supply his company with games, and he wanted to treat them like rock stars. He even packaged their first games in album-like folio, packages with pictures of the authors inside. 
Trip's first three hires were producers, and he made them draw lots to choose the developers they wanted to work with. The first producer chose Bill Budge. Remember, Bill Budge started Budge Co. and was publishing his two games. Well, Bill wanted to get back to programming, so he signed with EA and let them take over the distribution of his games. John Freeman left Epix in 1981 because of office politics, so he and his wife Ann Westfall started Freefall Associates. Ann was excited to start the company and learn a 6502 assembly language on the Atari 800. The same day that John incorporated Freefall Associates, he got a call from Trip Hawkins because the second producer at EA picked Freefall Associates to work with. Freefall created the hit games Archon and Archon 2 Adept. These two games were critical to EA's early success as a fledgling publisher. In fact, the first two contracts that EA signed were for Freefall Associates' first two games. Finally, the third producer chose Ozark Softscape. Mule, another seminal game, was created by Daniel Barry in 1983 because Trip Hawkins couldn't get SSI to sell him Cartels and Cutthroats. So Trip just contacted Danielle directly, and Danielle told Trip that her new company, Ozark Softscape, could make a better game. After those three choices, an avalanche of classic games was unreleased. In 1984, Will Harvey designed and programmed music construction set in 6502 assembly language when he was 15 years old and in high school, and EA published it. It was a huge hit, and it made him a million dollars. Ray Toby also published Sky Fox when he was 15 years old. In 1985, Seven Cities of Gold, another Daniel Berry creation, and her biggest hit was released. Bard's Tales created in 1985 by Michael Cranford while he was going to the University of California at Berkeley. Brian Fargo was a friend of his, so he took his game to Interplay's offices and he finished it there. The Bard's Tale established Interplay as a major publisher and gave it the resources to grow. And so this form of publishing continued, much like the book and music businesses. Big companies working with indies to publish their games, signing deals to pay for development costs with royalty arrangements. And indies keep creating their own companies because they can self-publish now. Finally, now it is absolutely mind-boggling to see the number of indie games that are out there in the app stores and downloadable from web pages. There are hundreds of thousands of games available, with hundreds being added every day. I have to conclude that the games industry really is the indie games industry, and it always has been. If you can make good games, you will have an audience. Thank you for listening and for being an indie game developer.